So here's a few news articles you might like. I just saw this. This is a tool to attack WordPress sites, um, which is nice. Uh, this one will do user enumeration and login brute forces. I haven't tested this tool, but we're certainly going to play with attacks like that. You can do some of this inside Burp. You can easily do it by writing your own Python scripts. But anyway, here's another tool that will try. Um, you give it a list of passwords to try, and it will just try all those passwords. Now, there are some extensions you can put in your WordPress site that will block this sort of attack, but a lot of people don't. And that's the main way people get hacked on WordPress is they put on extensions, and a lot of those extensions are sloppily written. So if you want to run a secure WordPress site, um, you really ought to Google and find some good blogs or tutorials on how to make a secure one and be very cautious about adding um, any plugins you don't need to and keeping everything updated because uh, WordPress sites are a huge part of the internet and they get hacked all the time and people blame PHP. It's not always the case that PHP sites are insecure, but in practice, they very often are because it's very easy to make mistakes in PHP, which we'll look a lot at as this course goes on. And uh, if you start adding more and more PHP code to your site, it usually doesn't take very long before somebody makes one of those common mistakes. Anyway, and so um, Parler, you know, is the uh, remaining platform that will let the alt-right terrorists inside America uh, plan their attacks. Um, Twitter kicked them off and Facebook kicked them off. Now, both Twitter and Facebook were extremely late to kick them off. They let them plot for years until they finally did that terrorist attack two weeks ago, right on the heart of the U.S. government. And that was when everybody um, decided that it's now bad business to let these people do it. Uh, it was good business before that because all the controversy causes people to watch more ads and open more pages, but there's some point at which supporting these people is a business risk that can no longer be tolerated. Um, so they moved to Parler. Now, Parler was a site that claimed to have content moderation, but it was a lie. They had no content moderation at all. And um, the CEO of Parler gave a very influential podcast interview, and what he revealed in that interview made people so upset that they can't, the AWS canceled him. And he couldn't find any hosting for a while. So now they are hosted in some secret unknown location and protected by DDoS Guard, which is run by the Russians. So this is, I find this kind of hilarious. I predict this, the logical place for the alt-right to go is Russia. I mean, Trump is the whole point of uh, the Trump presidency was to replace American democracy with an imitation of Putin's Russia. And it was strongly supported by Putin in many ways. And so I'm sure that the Russians would totally help them make this website. And that is what happened. So here they are. But now um, Parler has had a, a Medidos guard. This website that serves as a proxy has now had a bunch of their IP addresses removed because a lot of internet activists just independent people are opposed to this and they are hunting these people down. And so they hunted down what their IP addresses were and they found that this was not directly going to Russia. It was going to somewhere in Central America, Belize. And according to the people that hand out IP addresses, LAC Nick, you are not allowed to get IP addresses in one country when you don't really have an office in that country, just for the purpose of concealing your traffic. You're not allowed to do that. And that's what they did. This company that is probably Russian, just pretended to set up an office in Belize just to get these IP addresses. And he was able to prove that it was fake. And so they're removing their IP addresses that are being used for Parler. Um, this has happened to a lot of sites like 4chan and 8chan and um, the Pirate Bay. There's a bunch of websites, also Playpen. There's a bunch of websites that are just so radioactive that nobody can really host them. And they wander around the internet from hosting provider to hosting provider until they either go out of business or they hide behind Tor, which is a difficult business decision because many users can't find you anymore. Or they move to real bulletproof hosting, like really inside Russia, where there are people who will host you who don't care what you're doing. You can host illegal content, child pornography, malware, or anything, and they won't kick you off. But, um, uh, a lot of people find put geographic blocks to block that sort of site. So, you know, it's um, Parler is in the process of many other internet pariahs of bouncing from place to place, trying to find a home. So San Francisco, I've been hoping to get a vaccine in January. Then they announced the teachers might be able to get it in February. Now they're saying we might all get it by the end of June if they were lucky, which is a whole lot worse than what I thought, especially since the virus is mutating. And the new mutants 
are resisting the current antibodies and the current treatments. So they have not quite proven yet that the current vaccine will not stop the new mutants, but many people are now expecting that. So uh, it looks like by the time we get the vaccine, we'll need another vaccine. So I was hoping this would all be over in a couple more months. And my cynical friend said it'll be another year and it's looking like maybe they're right. Um, even if the Biden administration gets their act together and starts rushing out the vaccine efficiently, uh, it sounds like they're going to need another vaccine after this one. But anyway, we'll see what happens. Some of my friends that are over 70 have actually gotten their shots, but almost nobody else has. So it's, uh, it's a pretty gruesome thing in America. Uh, the virus is raging like crazy and our countermeasures are not doing much good right now. <laughs> and I don't see any hope of that changing anytime soon. So my classes will be online like this for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and uh, unless something big changes, I don't suppose we're going to have face-to-face -face classes in the fall either. There hasn't been any official announcement, but it uh, doesn't look good. Anyway, uh, so Macs, these new Macs that run on the ARM processors, I don't have one, but the people that get them say they're really fast. And now you can run Linux on them, which apparently you couldn't before. Um, so a new version of this Corellium port uh, lets you run more of Linux, although people say not all the hardware has the right drivers and such. So it's still kind of new. Um, but anyway, anybody have one of these? Be fun to hear what you think. Uh, yeah. The problem with them, of course, is you can't run legacy code very well. But they have some sort of translation tool to translate Intel code into the ARM code. And some people say it works pretty well. Anyway. And uh, let's see, we're got another minute or so. So here's some uh, political issues on the internet. Google is um, Google is in trouble because their AI ethicist was revealing internal activities and claiming they were unethical. And so they fired that person. And now they're firing other people for continuing to reveal the things they're doing that the ethical people don't like. And this is, um, Google's been doing a lot of this in the last year or two. They've been trying to silence internal dissent. There are do a lot of things that people get upset about. And uh, anyway, so there's another hot water scandal about that. And in the same spirit, there's Instacart. Instacart is firing a ton of people, like 20% of their entire staff, and they're firing the people who just voted to unionize. And they're claiming this is illegal, you know, picking on people for unionizing, and uh, you know, we'll see. But a lot of people are getting mad about that. Um, it is a big issue, of course, in San Francisco too, the gig workers. Anyway. Um, so we're up to 10 after, good. Then we can carry on with the official uh, introduction to the class. All right. And um, by the way, uh, you can use your webcam if you like, but you are gonna be recorded and posted in the video. So you should know that. Uh, anyway, um, the, so here we are. This is 129S. This is a hack, securing web applications. And I've been teaching this class for several years from the Web Application Hackers Handbook. And I'll continue to have this book used for background information, but I wrote a lot of projects myself and set up a lot of vulnerable servers for people to attack. But now the people that made this book and the people that made Burp, which is the main tool we're going to use, made a free online training, and this is wonderful. So I'm going to pretty much replace all the hands-on projects with the projects at the Web Security Academy, which are numerous and they're adding more. These are very good. Uh, I have some of my old projects still for the beginning couple of projects, and I might put some more in for like our optional extra credit. But really, this is a wonderful list of more projects than we need for the course. Very good. And so I'll, I, I recommend that as soon as you can, you sign up for the Web Security Academy and start doing those projects. So you'll find a schedule here. Um, there's for the City College students, there is a Canvas board up. Uh, for the non-city college students, I've actually got the Canvas board, but I forgot to put the link here. I'll have that up here later. Um, so you can, that's a place to turn in your projects, a place to take the quizzes, and a place to participate in the discussions that are due starting in a couple of weeks. Uh, so that's what determines your grade is participation in, uh, is turning in quizzes, homework, and discussions. You, att attendance for the class is not required. You can just watch the videos later or just ignore the videos and read the book or figure out any way you like. Um, and uh, I think that's all I need to tell you about course mechanics. If anybody wants to add the course, just add it inside the city college system and I'll put you in. If anybody wants to just take it without being part of the city college system, that's fine. You won't get any official college credit, but you can do the course. 
And uh, you'll have your own separate Canvas server that's available to the whole world, not the official City College one that you can use, which I'll post up here later. So uh, are there any questions? Let me see if I have anything in the chat. Uh, looks like nothing. All right. Anyway, I just want to talk about the first chapter and then demonstrate the first couple projects because the main thing is to do the hands-on projects. So that's what most people want to do. And uh, so let me make this big as much as I can. I guess that'll probably do. All right, move this off. Okay, so uh, the point here is, of course, the web has gotten complicated. Now we're using it for everything. The problem, there was a time when the web started, when you would just put up a static web page. Like mine is an example of a static web page, really, because I'm really very primitive here. So if you go to my web page, this is just an HTML, now it's PHP, but it's just a file that sits there. You can't log in, you can't post any comments on this page, you can't do any shopping on this page, it just sits there. It's just like a file that you're viewing. It has a couple other things like images and stuff, but it's just a boring file that sits there, except for a Twitter widget that I have down here that modifies a bit. So that's the old fashioned web, web 1.0, where it's just like a bulletin board. You put something up and people look at it and that's it. And that's fine, but that's like television. And that's not what people want. What people want is interactive stuff. Where you can log in and have comments and uh, social networking and everything else. And then you're gonna take data from users. And now you've got a problem since users are sending all kinds of data up to you, like tweets and logins and credit card numbers and stuff. Um, they might put malicious input in that data that came from them that has unexpected consequences on the server side. And that's the origin of web insecurity. So um, this kind of website, web 1.0 with no content still has a few security problems and you might be able to find some way to do something like a directory traversal and get into the operating system and deface the website or take over the server. But there weren't that many to worry about. But in a modern web app like Wikipedia, you log in, you create posts, you post them um, and you send up sensitive data that is supposed to be stored somewhere on the server like their password and yet somehow not leaked out to other people. So you have a natural many security issues. And as it is amazing how rapidly everything goes south and turns into a mess. And as you know, we got people gambling, using email, banking, all sorts of important things are going on on the web. And yet the web is not designed in a way to make security easy at all. So um, you got all these cloud services, people are keeping track of all their employee data on there and customer data and their offices and everything else. And the problem is it's all using a system that was never designed for this. The point of HTTP was to make it possible for very old, very weak servers to service a lot of clients. So it was designed for efficiency. They wanted to make it so that you can have a simple weak web server. And when a lot of people try to view the page, it can serve that page out really fast. So HTTP is connectionless. It does not establish a persistent connection with one user. A user sends one request, you send one reply, and then you forget. So when they come back later and send another request, the web server thinks they're a new person. It's like got amnesia. This saves RAM on the web server, but it means if you want to do something like a login and then see your mail, and a web server is supposed to show you your mail and not somebody else's mail, there's no easy way for it to remember who you are. That was bolted on much later. And all the features that you need for the modern web were just patched into this system that was not designed for that. So, and the other thing, of course, is people are running web browsers on their phones and just all sorts of gadgets all over the place. And a lot of those are really slow, weak devices with weak internet connections. So um, it turns out to be a real mess. Many, many different protocols, many, many different devices um, many of them designed for speed and simplicity by people that really don't understand or care much about security. So that you get a lot of ridiculous problems where people are just throwing sensitive data up there where everybody can see it, transmitting it with no encryption at all and doing all sorts of foolish things. And that's why the news is full of hacks and leaks and vulnerabilities. And that's what brings us all into this business. There's a huge market for people who learn about security to get jobs securing devices because it turns out to be a whole lot harder than anybody thought to make secure websites. And so you see things here. A lot of people put up these things. Your information is safe with us. Um, 
because we have something like an SSL certificate. So it's encrypted. And that's, that's of course, a nice thing, but that doesn't mean it's safe at all. That just means one problem has been fixed, but there are many other problems. If anybody claims to be completely secure, then what you know is they are an idiot. There is no such thing as complete security. Imagine that you wanted to walk down the street and you wanted to, you were afraid that someone was going to pull out a gun and shoot you somewhere. And you hired like a security guard. And he said, well, okay, I'll stand here and walk next to you. And that makes you completely safe. He's an idiot, right? Nobody's completely safe. Somebody could fly a drone over. They could put a bomb in a car. I mean, there's no such thing as perfect safety anywhere. All there is, is some degree of protection, which will stop some attackers, but there are always other attackers that you can't stop. So nothing is ever hundred percent secure. And so here's one of the things that I got people mad at me for. They put up this thing a few years ago, 100% secure online voting. All the experts in online voting say, just forget it. It's impossible. You'll never be able to make it secure enough at all. As we just saw in the last election, if people want to claim that there was something wrong with the election, then if it was online, how would you ever convince anybody it was good? What you have to have is paper ballots that you can put in a box that somebody can count. Then you have some way to check it. If you don't have that, how would anybody ever trust it? And the answer is nobody has found any system to do online voting that works well enough, although they use it in Estonia, but they never got, never used it in any large scale in America. And these companies that try to sell their online voting systems have not succeeded in convincing very many people to use them. Um, and all the real experts say, don't do it. So here's a study by your textbook authors showing how many web applications have serious problems like broken authentication. So it doesn't really know who you are. Um, Cross-site scripting. So you can run code on somebody else's machine by putting it on a website, leaking information. Cross-site request forgery means I can trick you into doing something you didn't intend to do, like buying my book on Amazon when you thought you were just reading my tweet, that sort of thing. And a lot of websites have these serious problems. Uh, it is ridiculous. And so here's another one of these. Um, this company had just a post request could be sent and you could then download the PII from any user. And I've, I've seen plenty of others like that myself. Um, this comes from APIs, application program interfaces. People put up a server, the server takes some requests from a website or from a, a web running on your phone or an app running on your phone and then hands out data. And it'll have maybe 10 functions on here and they forget to really bother to put security controls on all 10 functions. So there are functions that just anybody can access that they shouldn't be able to access. This happens a lot. Um, so you can make a certain request and then you see everything. And uh, this sort of mistake happens a lot. There's the other even simpler one, which is huge. Probably the biggest one in the last five years is open Amazon buckets. People make a database, they store a bunch of data in it and they just don't put any authentication on it at all. So anybody can just download all the data. There's just an endless chain of those going by. So um, if you look at mobile devices, for example, here's a list of the uh, um, top 10 risks. Mobile devices are very much like websites. So a lot of the number one, um, this has come a couple of years ago, but I thought it was very good. The number one flaw on mobile devices is actually on the server, server side controls. The most dangerous part of your phone app is usually the API running on the server. The phone app has a lot of problems too, but the API used to fetch data from the server is the most likely place to have enormous security flaws. But they also store the data insufficiently without securing it. They transport it without encrypting it and make many other mistakes. So uh, one thing I did was go through a lot of, of apps, Android apps, and show that they had a lot of vulnerabilities. All the famous companies had vulnerabilities. Many of them didn't bother fixing it. And uh, before that, I did a lot of web apps, college caps. And I found a whole bunch of web apps that had been defaced and it had um, Viagra selling pages added to their college web app that could only be seen if you searched through Google so they could resist there for a long period of time um, and uh, expose student data, SQL injection. And you know, notifying these people is very unlikely to get anything fixed. Um, this is another big issue in the security community is there's a small number of people like us in this class and the people who do CTF contests that know about security and we think it's interesting and we find problems and then we fix them. But the majority of people, like 90% of people 
out there and important people, the CEOs, powerful people are just afraid of security people. They think we're like dangerous, scary witches or something. And when you try to tell them about a security problem, they just get afraid of you and punish you and try to lock you up or something. You can't tell them you've got a problem and you have to fix it. The only companies you can really say that to are ones that run bug bounty programs. All the rest, I've done a lot of it, hundreds of companies. If you notify a company that doesn't have a bug bounty program, you're pretty much wasting your time. If you, they will just ignore everything you say, or they will try to punish you or sue you or prosecute you. It's extremely unlikely that they will ever actually understand and fix the problem. In my experience, the chance of them actually fixing the problem is 2%. So all the experts told me years ago, never tell anybody about a problem you find, just let them get hacked. And that is the professional thing to do. I still tell companies sometimes, but um, it's pretty much a wasted activity. Um, the, the people to talk to are people who run bug bounty programs. Now they have grown up, they've gained some maturity, they have admitted that we might have security problems. And if so, we would like to know about them and we would like to fix them. And we might even like pay you some money. Those are the people to tell about problems. <laughs> Other people, uh, you're pretty much wasting your time um, because they have to go through a whole series of uh, emotional issues to get there. They have to admit that they have problems, admit that they actually have to pay money and hire staff to fix the problems. And they're all gonna try to pretend that's not true for years before they admit it. So here's the core problem is that the users send, can commit arbitrary input from their data. They can alter the cookies, the headers and all the parts of a web request coming from their machine. And anything done a lot of, when you go to a website and you view something, you can ask which website which, which server is doing that work? So if I go to like um, google.com and search for something, let me do that. If I, okay, I go to Google. I search for say shoes. Okay, so I find a picture of a shoe. Now I ask you which computer did the processing to make this shoe? this picture of a shoe up here. And the answer is very complicated. Some of my some of it was done on my machine to render, to set aside this page and render the picture and draw it in the browser. Some of it was done on Google server to hunt through things. Some of it came from some advertiser's machine. The fact is many machines ran code to generate that picture on my screen. It's not as simple as one place. So that means how much of what happened to draw this on my screen was under my control. I could modify my browser to have like an ad blocker and then this ad would vanish. I could um, grab the requests coming in and modify them before they hit the browser. A lot of this is under my control. And the web developer that designed the website that feeds this often does not understand what portion of their code is running on the client's machine and what portion is running on the server's machine. And therefore they trust some important thing like determining the price or determining my name or story my password is being done securely on the server, but it's in fact being done on the client. This is one big mistake. And I, I saw in the chat a question, are bug bounties a waste of time? And that is an open question. I mean, if beginners participating in bug bounties to try to is, um, okay, let me say, if you join a bug bounty program and you start trying to earn money, you probably won't earn any money because the problem is um, you have to be the best in the world. You have to be the first one to find a vulnerability. I, I've only earned a few hundred bucks after years of doing it, hardly worth, the, not at all worth the bother. So as far as making a living, it's very unlikely that you'll make enough money in a bug bounty program, unless you are the best guy in the world. What you will probably find is when you find something, they'll just tell you, oh, somebody else found it first, or we don't care about that. That's what I usually get. So you do learn something from trying though. And so like I say, we're going to... Um, this port swigger thing does teach you the kind of skills that are used during bug bounties, but you will only earn significant amounts of money if you become the world's expert. And so realistically, I would not say that this class is preparing you to make money on a bug bounty program. What this class is preparing you is a much more modest goal. It's preparing you to get a job at a company securing their website. That's the point. That You don't have to be the best in the world for that. You just have to be a competent professional for that. And that's the kind of thing you can do from here. But, you know, this is like the difference between, um, you know, playing music that goes in and advertising and being a rock band that goes on tour. Those guys have to be the best in the world, but you could be like one guy playing in a concert, in a uh, orchestra by just being more average. Anyway, that's the thing.
Good. So uh, I see some good comments there. But I certainly would not expect to make money in bug body programs, um, any significant amount of money, because the competition is too stiff. Anyway, it's a very good question. Now, whether companies should run a bug bounty is another interesting question. Does it actually benefit your company? And I think uh, the jury's out on that too. A lot of companies jump into bug, running a bug bounty program and they're not really ready for it. And they haven't really fixed the obvious problems and they haven't really assigned enough staff to take all the reports and do anything intelligent with them. And so they end up just sort of wasting their time and not getting much benefit from it. Um, it is... Necess you have to carefully plan your bug bounty program and work with professionals that will help you, or you can easily end up just wasting your time on a bunch of reports that tell you things you don't understand or can't benefit from. So, you know, bug bounty programs can be very frustrating for the bounty seekers and the company, but some of them are quite successful, like Microsoft's bug bounty program and Google's and Facebook's. I think those are working pretty well. But um, anyway, though I see a lot of good comments going by and that's fine. Anyway, so um, that's the issue here. Um, your users are not just going to a browser and doing what the developer expected. They are using tools like Burp, which is what we're going to use that lets you modify code, modify traffic coming in and out of your machine and do things that the designer didn't intend for you to do. And so they often find vulnerabilities. Um, all right, so I could, for example, change the price of an item if it turns out that the price is determined by something on my machine instead of something on the server. I could modify a token so I get into somebody else's account. I could use SQL injection, which lets me run code on the server in a language called SQL, which lets me steal data from a database. And all of these are not prevented by encryption. HTTPS makes you into a secure HTTP site. But all that means is the traffic is encrypted and the identity of the server is verified. So you know who you're talking to and the encryption means that no person in between you and the server can read the data, which is fine. That does protect your passwords from theft by people that are sniffing the packets as they go by, but it doesn't stop any of these attacks, which are based on causing the server to get malicious data, which I sent the server. Um, so many kinds of attacks still remain. So this is the problem. Um, your developers typically don't really understand the security implications of their decisions. They're typically rushing to get a product out to make it look pretty, to make it handle enough users, and they don't really understand how to secure it. And another big problem is that there are many servers at a company and extra things patched on so that no one developer typically understands all the stages of processing through which the data goes. So uh, it's, we'll talk about this, but the, uh, the natural course of business is to rush out more features faster and faster and um, security usually ends up getting overlooked and mistakes keep getting made. And so uh, in the old days, uh, before 2002, Microsoft's official recommendation for a company network is you should have one firewall and then have all the machines inside the network in your trusted zone. But that's ridiculous these days. There's sneaky malware that can get on the machine. People are bringing in laptops and phones and USB sticks from home. There's no longer any trusted security parameter. Now we're moving to a zero trust model where they say, just assume that there could be malicious people anywhere in your network, some of the laptops inside your corporate network, and you have to have layers of defenses to consider that. So anyway, um, all right. So this is uh, more difficult. You cannot easily draw a barrier and say, I trust everything inside this barrier and all the attacks are coming from the other side of that barrier. It's not that simple at all. For example, one big issue these days is business email compromise. They manage to get a password to get into somebody's email account or find a vulnerability, and then they start sending emails from the company email server to like the billing department in the company saying, okay, the boss just told you to send some money to me over here. And that's coming from inside your company, from a trusted server, from an authenticated account that is a real company employee. So how do you know that's malicious? And that's the problem. Um, that's why you have to move to the zero trust model. All right. And so in general, a lot of vulnerabilities are being fixed as Microsoft and WordPress and everybody is updating their stuff. The old generation of simple flaws like buffer overflows is going down. And as time passes, there are less flaws, but um, different flaws appear as you move to more and more complicated models. So 
and that's why everybody now has just a steady flow of updates like patch Tuesday, whatever you use, you have to constantly update it. Um, amateurs, when you ask them and say, what is your, um, the main security defense, they believe antivirus is protecting them. Professionals laugh at that. Antivirus is incredibly easy to defeat. It stops about 2% of attacks. It stops some attacks, so it's not completely useless, but it doesn't mean at all that there's nobody exploiting your machine. And uh, the number one security feature that prevents attacks is updates. If you update things quickly, then nobody can use known attacks on you that have already been patched. And that doesn't make you 100% safe either, but it makes you a lot safer. And anyway, um, all right. So there's still plenty of flaws. Now, I've got some cahoots here. Let me see if I can bring them up. Um, and uh, let's see, cahoots. I don't remember if I have to do anything goofy with this browser. All right. Uh, yeah, um, I'm doing this book does not go into the tangled web by Michael Zalewski. I've heard about it, but I haven't been through that one. So we're just doing the other one, Web Application Hackers Handbook and Port Swigger. Although I've heard the tangled web is very good. All right, just a moment. I've got my cahoots here, but I forgot to pick this one out in advance. So I'm going to have to search a bit. 129S. All right. Oh, that's not right. Hooch. She net 129s. All right. There we go. And there's, there we are. That's the one I wanted. Okay. So the way these work, um, you answer questions and you'll get extra credit if you're one of the uh, top three at answering these questions. So let me just make sure randomize is on and it is. All right. So go to kahoot.it and then put in that number, 203-7336. And I'll see when you join. And then we have a little game. I throw these in lectures to keep people awake. So let me, while that's loading, I should be hearing sounds. There we go. And I will get a page open to save the answers or rather the winners. There we are, okay. This is CNET.120 on S. Okay. It's 121. Good. All right, we got 29 people, so I'll wait a bit. See how many want to join. All right, I'll give it about five more seconds. I guess that's it. Okay. All right, what makes web two different from the early web? Okay, and that's it, user submitted content. By the way, it rates you not only by whether you're right, but also by how fast you answer. That's why it's able to determine a winner even with just a few questions. So there you go. That's why he, somebody was so fast they got 932 points by answering correctly and really fast. All right, so what does SSL stop? OK, 
okay, it stops. SSL is really what we're using is the later version TLS, but that encrypts the data in transit. So people in the middle cannot read it or modify it. It does not stop any of these attacks, which happen at the server after the data gets there, but it does stop third parties from intercepting the data in transit and reading it or messing with it. All right. And what's the most common website vulnerability? Okay, and it is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is in something like 80% of all websites. It's extremely common. Most companies will not pay you if you find it in a bug bounty program. They don't care. They won't fix it because cross-site scripting does not let you get control of the company server and steal the company's data. It just lets you attack another user by bouncing an attack off the company server. And most companies are not considered legally liable for that. So they don't consider this to really be their problem very much, which is kind of a shame. But anyway, that's the way it is. Cross-site scripting is extremely common. And most people just don't really care about it much, but you can use it to harm people anyway. All right. And what's the most important defense method? All right, all these are good, but the single most important one is probably updates. All right, so we should see who won. And it is, okay, Camino. We'll draw. And I, uh, I will have to tell me your real name if you want to get some points. You get three extra credit points for being in the top three. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop the lecture briefly. I'll resume it in about 10 minutes because I want to break it into two pieces.